with that, um, I'll invite you to, to listen to, to Richard, uh, Richard Gunn, and he's going to be telling us all about uh, common sense in Scottish Enlightenment philosophy. All about. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'll talk for about 20 minutes, something like that, and then we can we can go into the discussion. Yeah. It's it's absolutely your fault. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I, I promise not to talk too much, and if I do, you can sort of shout or stamp your feet or do something like like that to <laughs> indicate or shut shut me up. Oh, thank. Um, I seem to be surrounded by various aids of a quasi-technical <laughs> kind. I've got a lantern, a lecture and I've got a thing that falls down. It's quite difficult to make it stand up. And this doesn't work in with that. And that doesn't work. And, <laughs> and, and also I, I have a sore back, which is why I'm mainly sitting down. Also because the whole point about common sense is not for me to kind of tell you what it is, but common sense is meant to be something that is shared amongst us. So my sitting down has got a quasi-democratic purpose, but it's mainly because of the, the sort of that. <laughs> but that's my kind of um, plea for sympathy, yeah, before anything else. Um, right, so what is common sense? I was going to say, why are we thinking about common sense here now? But that's a more complicated I mean, What is common sense? What's to say about it, well, at first sight, can you hear me all right? If I, if I, if I, yeah, okay, if I, um, um, at first sight, there's nothing to say about common sense because it's all obvious, but that, that actually is one of the meanings of the term common sense, yeah, that common sense is what counts as obvious. That's the most usual everyday meaning of the term in the world that we live in. Oh, it's all, it's all obvious. It's clear. That's a table. It's obvious. That's, it's common sense that that's a book. It's obvious. Yeah, it's obvi obvious. This comes in very, very quickly. Um, and indeed, the, 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 the um, 18th century Scottish Enlightenment philosopher Thomas Reed, I'll read out just a short, very short bit. My glasses on, so stupid glasses, I'm afraid. Very well. Pay no attention. I'm um, trying not to pay no, atten pay no attention to the glasses, but pay attention to what you are reading. Um, if there are certain principles, as I think there are, which the constitution of our nature leads us to believe, and which we are under a necessity to take for granted in the common, common concerns of life, without being able to give a reason for them, these are what we call the principles of common sense, and what is manifestly contrary to these principles is what we call absurd. Now that comes very close to saying that common sense is what's obvious. Actually, Thomas Reed has got slightly more complicated and interesting things to say about common sense, but that carries a kind of sense of, of obviousness. But it, the very word common should make us sort of think, because it should make us think, well, why does something seem obvious to us? And the question that we can then raise in connection with that is, well, something seems obvious to us because it is commonly held by the society that we live in to be the obvious truth. Yeah, so obviousness could, be, could even be a sort of false obviousness. It could seem obvious to us because everybody else tells us that it's the case. That is a book, that is a book, that is a book. And we get sort of, oh, it's obviousness, obviously a book. So the common meaning of something has got overtones that isn't, aren't, that aren't entirely um, covered by the term um, obviousness. Now, and what I want to tell you about, first of all, is really that, that the notion of, of common sense philosophy has got very little to do with the notion of obviousness. In fact, if you want to understand anything about common sense philosophy or what counts as common sense according to philosophers, um, probably the best thing to do is to put the whole notion of obviousness to one side. I start off talking about it because it's the obvious thing to talk about, <laughs> yeah? the, the evident thing to talk about. Um, but um, 
If you want to get into what common sense philosophy has to say, the best thing to do is not to get misled too much by dwelling upon the notion of obviousness. So what does common sense, what is common sense philosophy and what does it have to say? What, how does it understand the term common sense? That's the first thing I want to tell you about. If there is time, and I'm already going to be running out of time even before I start, if I'm not careful, um, the next thing I want to tell you about is the connection between common sense philosophy and the notion of a general education, because the notions of common sense and a general education go very closely together in the common sense tradition, and it's one of the most important aspects of the whole thing. And thirdly, if we've got time, and I probably won't really do this until we get into a conversation later on, um, I'll, I want to reminisce, uh, reminisce, a bit of reminiscence, personal reminiscence about um, common sense philosophy in the 1980s, that's to say earlier in my own lifetime, um, and how that might relate to common sense philosophy in the here and now. But that's, I, maybe I'll get on to that, but that's, that, I, I won't tackle that first. So first of all, what does common sense philosophy have to say about common sense? What does it understand common sense? I think, the, 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 first of all, the co common sense philosophy is, is as old as the hills. It goes back to ancient Greece and Aristotle, and, and, and it goes back to, to Roman thought, ancient Rome, um, and the, the, the term of common sense um, is, a, 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 is a translation of sensus communis, which is a Latin expression. Um, and if you want to kind of put a notion of common sense in your mind, it's not tagged on to the notion of obviousness. If you want to kind of mark the difference in your mind, yeah, you can think about it as sensus communis, yeah, and, 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 and as, which is, you partly cover explain the sense of communities in terms of obviousness, but it's not the whole story. There's more to be said about it. So sense of communities. Now what I want to say is one and two. That's really my own, virtually my only visual aid this afternoon. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and I like simple visual aid. <laughs> right, let's go with it. There are two possible meanings of the term common sense. Now these are, the, 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 these are two ways in which the term common sense has been understood by common sense philosophers going back through the Renaissance, back through the Middle Ages, back through the um, ancient world. So these two meanings or resonances or implications or accounts of common sense have to be found in, 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 in um, earlier thought as well. So I'm not making this up, I'm sort of summarizing what is there before. Right, now one meaning of the term census communis is, is actually, sorry, back one sentence, this one sentence. Um, what they both signify is the notion of shared sense. Co common sense is shared sense. And, if we, and, and the difference between one and two is a difference between the, the two kinds of sharing. Okay? Two kinds of, of sharing. Or two kinds of things that are shared. One. Uh, now, number one, the, 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 the obvious example there, the, oh, sorry, this word obvious keeps creeping in, I have to try to keep it out. Um, the, 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 what is understood under one is that common sense is a, a sense that is shared by a number of individuals, a number of discrete separate individuals, and a number of individuals who perhaps form a community or a group. Um, for instance, you might decide that everything that Richard Gunn has to say is a load of rubbish, and that might be the consensus this afternoon. In that case, that's a, the common sense, the shared sense yeah, of this group in, 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 in the, the, your view of what Richard Gunn has to, to say. So common sense, in, under meaning one, presupposes more than one individual. It presupposes a plurality of individuals, a group of individuals or, or, or a community of individuals. And what is shared are a number of, of, um, of individuals who are group members. I suppose you could say that it's close to the 20th, 21st century uh, term ideology. Yeah, but I'm a bit... <coughs> uh, the term ideology carries so much baggage that I'm not sure that it really helps a lot, but that, that's, it's a kind of thing that's meant under common sense, uh, 
one. Common sense two, what's going on here? Well, common sense two is, is, is again, it's a shared sense, but at what is being shared in this example, uh, in this meaning, um, are not a number of separate, discrete, separate individuals, uh, but the five senses that we are all familiar with, sight, touch, smell, etc., etc. Ironically, on the other side of this board, someone talking in this room has written the five senses, sight, <laughs> touch. If, I, if this was with a more wieldy kind of visual aid, I could turn it around. These are the five senses. <laughs> but I don't know what the person was on about, except they used indelible ink, so we can't get it all. <laughs> so, 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 so anyway, that, that, so, so shared sense, Number two, common sense number two, is, is common sense is, is, is a, 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 a sense that is shared by the, the five senses. And in that meaning of the term common sense, then common sense number two um, is in each one of us as individuals. You don't need to have a whole number of individuals to have common sense number two. Um, it, uh, all you need to focus on is one individual who's got the five well, presumably it's got the five, all, all the five senses. And viewed in that way, the sharing of all fit is the following kind of idea. The idea is uh, common sense is thought of as a kind of sixth sense. You know the expression of sixth sense? I had a sixth sense. That's actually what's you know, kind of almost supernatural kind of idea. But the idea of the sixth sense is thought of as being a sense that combines the other five and makes a coherent picture out of the different senses. So that, for instance, um, in terms of, of sight, I look at this um, corner of the, the, the table and it looks, it looks sharp. Okay? But now if I put my hand out and shut my eyes and reach forward, I don't feel something rounded and smooth. Yeah? I get a coherent, uh, there's coherence between my sense of sight and my sense of touch because what looks sharp also feels sharp. Um, and you could say, well, you know, why? Why is that? I mean, how, how do we totalize our senses in this way? How do we make our senses tell a coherent tale? Yeah, and it's not always the case. You know, I suppose if somebody is dreaming, you could imagine it a nightmare where somebody is stumbling through a countryside and everything that looks sharp and jagged actually is smooth and slippery and keeps falling. Or so I, I don't, but you can, you can imagine a state of disordered consciousness where the senses don't totalize. But in our usual, hopefully in our everyday, the fact that everybody has got to this room safely today suggests that they've got common sense in, 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 in that in that meaning. Otherwise, you'd be floundering around the corridor, corridor outside or getting involved in the march and the street or something, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, the interesting question, and this is the end of my book, gets to the conclusion of my little um, philosophical exposition. I'm, I'm leaving out names and, and quotes and things like that. Like that, but um, oh, I, I suppose I should mention that in 18th century Scotland and the Scottish Enlightenment, that Scottish common sense philosophy um, was quite important. Thomas Reid, who I quoted, is the main common sense philosopher, and indeed Thomas Reid, in different of, of his writings, understands senses communities in actually both of these different places in his work. You can find sort of traces of different, you know, of the different, the two different meanings. Um, and you could think of Scottish 18th century philosophy in part the kind of interplay between these two different meanings of, of common sense. Sometimes they're together, sometimes they're separate and so on. So we can talk about that in detail if you like, but I won't go into the, the history of ideas aspect of it here. The conceptual question that arises from what I just said is, are, are these two meanings um, exclusive? Is it a kind of either or thing? You've got to go for, like, if you've gone for number one, <clears throat> then, then you've got to reject number two. If you go for number two, if you reject number one. Um, I think the obvious thing to say is, well, no, they're not actually exclusive. They can be understood, they can both, this common sense can be understood in both of those meanings. And the really interesting question is not whether they can be, the two meanings can be related, but how they can be related. Um, and I think the interesting line of thought that comes out of 18th century philosophy 
or an interesting line of thought is to say, well, uh, maybe, I mean, how are these two things combined? Well, maybe it's the art combined in and through each other. Maybe it's, it's when we look upon ourselves as members of a, a public interactive world, a world where there's more than one individual. We try to justify our views in common with other individuals. That it's when we try to do that, that we begin to tell a coherent story about the sensory experiences that we have. And so our, 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 it's because we are public or interactive individuals that we can have common sense in meaning too. And conversely, and what kind of public interactive world do you want to live in? Well, a society, a society where there are mature and uh, individuals who can, who are, uh, can tell coherent stories about themselves and can, can make sense of the world in a coherent way. And it's because um, we have individuals like that, that we can then live in a, a, a free and interactive and, 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 and worthwhile uh, social uh, social manner. Um, so the, the, the interesting line of thought is to say perhaps it's in and through each of these senses that the other can, come in, comes into existence. It's a combination of the two that is the kind of $64,000 question. How can we see these meanings of com common sense as, as related. Uh, and quite a number, I think, of 20th century philosophers can be seen, like the late Wittgenstein, for example, mentioned but one, um, that, that, that can, can be seen as attempting to combine the two, the two meanings, in a, at, least, at least in a loose and general kind, kind, of, kind of way. Okay, now um, I'm getting to the end of my 20 minutes. But I just want to tell you a moment, a little bit about, about common sense and um, general education. Um, and in doing that, I'd like to mention uh, the name of a person who got me involved in thinking about all of these things, uh, George Davy, who was my teacher in philosophy back in the 19, God help us, 60s or 70s or something like that, 60s and, and 70s. Um, and, uh, and it then became a close friend of George later on in, in his, his life. Um, and he published a, a book called The Democratic Intellect um, in 1961, well, I think it was, uh, 1961. And it's, it's just been uh, republished by um, Edinburgh University Press. And I'm delighted to say that Murdoch McDonald and Richard Gunn wrote the introduction to this. Um, so a, a lot of my thoughts about this come from George Davy. <laughs> um, can you manage? Sorry, I'm sorry, George. Oh, <laughs> don't 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 tell us. <laughs> Yes, we could probably get there. Right. Um, yeah, I, I just, my, my presentation falls into three bits. I'm probably not going to have time to talk about this. The third, but I've just finished talking about number one. So you're coming in at the beginning of number two, where I've talk, been talking about notion of common sense and general education. Yeah. Just, just to let you know, Richard, there's plenty of time, so you, you, you're welcome to take as much time as you, you feel you, you, you want to speak. So. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I came across some. Bit of data that somebody once told me that, that the, the ideal attention span of million human individuals is 20 minutes. So I don't need to, to push it. To <laughs> yes, you want to start. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry to be sitting down, I've got so bad. 
Full of common sense, but that's sort of back. Okay. Just, just, just sh sh shout out if I'm not being clear. Just, just, just shout and make it. Yeah. Okay. So the the, the um, second part of what I want to say, uh, briefly anyway, I, I won't go too far beyond the twenty minutes, but. Um, I want to say just a word or two anyway about common sense and general education because the notion of common sense and general education are very often linked together in the common sense tradition and especially in the work of George Davy, which I was mentioning um, earlier. And uh, George has, has a, a the, the very first chapter of his book, um, which has got the rather unpromising title, um, the, the Presbyterian Inheritance. <laughs> um, which, I mean, in terms of it, it's a book about the history of ideas, and in terms of the history of ideas, it makes sense that it should be called the Presbyterian Inheritance, but um, I don't think it's got anything at all what about Presbyterians in that <laughs> chapter, or indeed in most of the book. So, um, but that, that, what that chapter does is it sets out the notion of, of general education in the context of Scottish 18th and 19th century universities in particular. And so if you want to get an introduction into that kind of world of thinking, um, then the George Davies' first chapter is probably the best thing to, to have to have a look at, despite his dreadful title, Presbyterian um, Inheritance. Um, I mean, Presbyterian Inheritance of the people in the street outside. <laughs> and, well, or maybe there's more than one Presbyterian Inheritance. I'd, I'd like to think of um, Anyway, right. So, then, what George Davy talks about is he talks, when he talks, I say the phrase general education, he said the general, in, in the, the kind of education he's talking about is that the, 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 the general should take precedence over the particular uh, and the whole over the parts. And in, uh, this is just very loose, but a, a, a general education um, is one that doesn't try to, to uh, uh, train individuals to be any one particular thing, like an expert philosopher, or, um, an, or an expert philosopher, or an, 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 an expert, um, a computer expert, or, or, or a, a computer, uh, or, or, or um, an ex expert tea maker, or whatever it might be, or an expert brain surgeon. Um, uh, general education is meant to, to produce people who are generalists and who have a, an understanding of a number of things, and not merely a number of things, but who are particularly uh, good at thinking about the, the, first, the conceptual first principles on which these, these specialisms rest. Yeah, so uh, 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 the way in which a generalist would approach some other um, specialism would be say, well, what, what sort of principles or, or axioms or assumptions or premises does this specialism rest upon? And, it, and, and so a, a generalist education is one where conceptual or philosophical questions, questions of conceptual first principles, um, is, is, is all important. Um, and uh, as George Davy says about that, that in the, the, the Scottish education that George is talking about, that uh, philosophy acquired a commanding position in the higher educational system. Um, and that there were actually, even at the time of, um, of Tony Blair's government, there was even an attempt, apparently, I think, to, to, to have philosophy taught in, in schools, yeah? 
So that, like, not in the university, but in school. And I, I would imagine this, if it was done properly, it could work really well. I mean, it always seems to me that uh, kids are really very philosophical. And they're right, certainly, it's saying, why? Why, you know, you know that, that's a march out in the street. Why, why is there a march? You know, that, that, and so it gets, it gets you going thinking about, about first principles in a very direct kind of way. Anyway, sorry, that's a digression, really. But I think the notions of a general education and a philosophical education go very closely together in this kind of, kind of thinking that, 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 um, George Davy uh, who champions the notion of common sense and the notion of general general education, that the notion of philosophical education comes into play. Now, so the question, and this is the last thing I really want to, to, to talk about before we have a break and I get a cup of tea. Um, that, that, that what I, I want to, to, to say is, well, how does common sense, the notion of common sense, um, notions of common sense relate to the notion of general education. Uh, people who talk about common sense, like George Davy, talk about a general education and very, and quite often vice versa. So why, why should we think of that there's a connection between common sense philosophies um, and uh, the notion of, of, of a general education? And that is what I try to tackle really in part two of the paper that I'm talking um, from. Um, and my suggestion, and it really is just only a suggestion, so it's not a, 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 I started off telling you what was the case in terms of the history of ideas. Now you're, we're into the realm of, of, of Richard Gunn's um, rambling um, thoughts about the matter. Um, the, the, um, my, my suggestion is that, that com, com, general education comes into play with common sense thinking in the following way that if we say to ourselves what is it to think in the spirit of common sense about something whatever it might be book writing or marching or anything you, you, you like and I think what comes into play when you some when you try to apply if you like a common sense perspective to a topic is we try to bring it, but what, what once yeah, we don't try to bring it into mind, it just comes into mind, is the, 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 the background to whatever that topic is. It's a, it's a background considerations become very important. Um, and you can think of this in terms of, of, of conversation. But, I mean, if, if I'm talking to a specific group of people here, having a conversation with the people in this room here and now, but of course there's a background, there's all the people outside, yeah? There's, there's possibly people who might be sort of whispering, you can maybe just hear them just out, you know, on the edge of our, and, and, and then right, right outside there's other people banging things and talking about things and all this, this, this kind of thing. So when we raise any topic, we do so against the background of a larger discussion, an extended, almost indefinite discussion, this is common sense, common sense meaning one, yeah? Common sense is shared by a range of, 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 of individuals. Um, and when we focus upon um, the, the background to, to something, it's at that point that when we're focusing on something in its background, we can't rely upon the, the axiomatic principles on which any particular specialism is erected. Yeah, we've got to ask for, a, 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 if we're thinking in terms of a, a thing, a, an issue, a topic against a background, uh, we've got to ask that specialism to give some account of its specialist principles and say why it wants us to look upon the world in a particular way. So, I mean, I, actually, I was going to give an example of a natural science, but I won't digress into that. We can conversation if, if you use um, so um, in, in, in in common sense philosophy uh, in common sense philosophizing um, it, we, we can't simply appeal to the principles of any one specialism or any one range of specialism we've got to take into we've got to in, engage with the, 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 the principles uh, on which those specialisms rest, or not just what the specialism rests, but what anybody, the principles that are, are assumed in what anybody has, a, anybody has to say about anything. 
really. Um, in other words, we've got to think um, in um, a, a, a philosophical way. In the, we, we've got to, to be engaged in something like not just spreading specialisms across the world in our notion of education. We've got to be engaged in raising questions of, prim of first principles about the various discourses and, and modes of theorizing and so on and so forth that exist or that have, are raised in, in, in the world as a whole. Um, <clears throat> and so that's why the notion of common sense leads us on to think um, in terms of, of general education. And that's why the notion of common sense and the notion of general education uh, go closely um, t t t together. Um, there, there's a, a, a sort of thing, a point that follows on from that, which is that if, of course, one is concerned in a more commonsensical sort of point of view to, to focus, to bring into, well, to, to acknowledge that there is this indefinite background of non-expert uh, opinion, it might be expert or it might not be, but it's different kind of opinions from um, our own. Um, then, and, and if we're engaging in, in, in discussion about first principles, um, <clears throat> then um, I think, I'll, I'll say this quickly, we can talk about it if you like. I, 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 basically, it means that the distinction between introductory discussion and specialist discussion appears in a new light. Quite, if you're a specialist, you think, well, specialist stuff is very rigorous and tight and logical. Introductory stuff is, is just being more easy to understand and a bit looser and not so rigorous. If you're a commonsensical character, you think that introductional, introductory thought is as rigorous and as difficult and as challenging as specialist thought. I'm not saying that specialist thought may not, may not be a justification from time to time in many situations of general, of, of, of specialist thought. I hope that if a brain surgeon has to deal with my brain, it's a specialist brain <laughs> surgeon. I'm not against specialism as such, but the sort of general education which is being talked about here is one which has respect for what is usually dismissed as being merely introductory. I think that things that are merely introductory are as important, both a different kind of importance, um, from a commonsensical standpoint. Um, and <clears throat> I think the notion of, of if you like, I put it, a, a non-patronizing introduction is the kind of tone which a commonsensical perspective wants to, to, to strike. Um, now, that's talking about common sense in terms of common sense one, where there's lots of individuals having this in the definite discussion. Common sense two, well, I, I won't go on about that, I'll stop in a second. But you can say, well, background considerations do come in to play there as well. And you see this in conversation when through the metaphors that we use. People talk about, um, for, I wrote some examples of it down here, if I think of the examples. Yes, yeah, so a, a smooth sound, a discordant combination of colors, a vivid person, a spiky thought. Quite often metaphors relate different senses together in an interesting kind of way. Yeah, a discordant um, combination of colors, discordant, is a metaphor drawn from sound, as in music, yeah? And the colors are, of course, visual, yeah? But you can still talk about discordant colors. And it's quite interesting how language makes some of these commonsensical connections in, in, in um, sense, too. Um, so the importance of background applies both under one and under two um, as well. Now, as to reminiscences about what happened in the 1980s when George's thought became a focus, a beacon for a, a range of radical uh, and, and far-reaching um, alternative discussion, and, and when a, a tone of voice of, of non-patronizing introduction came into play through journals like um, the Edinburgh Review in the 1980s, or a journal I was involved in, and I don't know where I put it. Yes, a journal called 
actually common sense, yeah, <coughs> which really got the right idea, but um, which uh, is now defunct. Um, but you can, there's a, there's a common sense website. You can consult all the back issues of common sense through its period, through its, its run from 1987 up to the late 1990s on this website. And my own personal website, if you can see it from over there, is at the bottom. So this paper that I've been talking from, Common Sense, a presentation, is on my website, for instance. So if anybody wants to follow that through, they can do so by, by looking it up on the website. And you'll meet it with various typos and things like that, and you might, you might not enjoy finding. <laughs> okay, that's it for today. But we can, I'm, I'm, I'm now dry and I want a cup of tea, and that's a good cue for a conversation in a moment. Shall <laughs> we break for a Tea. I know you have to take a few questions afterwards. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, I'll tea, everyone. Yeah. Very good. Super. Great. Okay. I was like a fixed with term of Thank you. 
So it's more people that are fear, training, by state, the issue, there is one of the things that there is is which is a reasonable thing to space for what of the Right. Uh, 
Uh, I will try and deal with with the complaint in out. Uh, and also in the I shall now, I'm not a Christian, and I'm I actually think the constant is It's the approach of the state. I think that's a very Shall we uh, get on with uh, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll the process and the I've got a bell. High tech. High tech. Yeah, high tech. Don't give me toys like that. I, I, I reveal the five year old that I, I actually am. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Um, with that, let, uh, let's, let's have some questions about common sense. And, uh, well, uh, can, can I just say about questions? First of all, that I'm a bit hard of hearing as far as conversation is concerned. Shout your question. Yes. But that's, one, that's one thing. But the other thing is that questions suggest that there's many common sense. It's just me here and you all talk to yeah. So so feel free to get involved in a discussion where you comment on each other. Yeah. Despite the fact you're all sitting in rows, you can you can pretend that we're actually doing doing that. Actually, I've got a question comment. I'll stand up and shout. <laughs> but um, the very fact of common sense against a background of social norms and expectations, mm. um, that oftentimes we see something or we do something that goes against common sense mm. because it adheres to social norms. Mm. And how do you see that? I don't think you're going to need to yeah. I, th I think they, they, I don't know, <laughs> like most questions, I don't really have a proper <laughs> answer to it. But um, first of all, I think it's important that when we do things against common sense, that very often we're against the, what seems, what someone has persuaded us is the obvious meaning of common sense, yeah? So very often when we go by, no, we, we, we act on the basis of norms, but set common sense aside. It's because someone has told us that, 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 that that's the obvious truth, yeah, and you're ignoring the obvious truth. Now, the obvious truth is very often what is socially accepted in a society, yeah, common sense, number, number, number one. Uh, so that's one thing that I would say in, in, in response to that, to slightly defuse the question, but not entirely. And I think the other thing, actually, what um, he was sitting there has gone away. But what I was just saying a minute ago, actually, in conversation, was that um, I don't know if this really um, touches on what you're, you're asking about, but it seems to me that, that actually 
that a, a common sense, as I understand, it's only common sense number one, flourishes um, best in well in conversations. Yeah, and conversations are remarkably, if you like, powerful things to 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 get people drawn into because a conversation. One way of thinking about a conversation, about conversations, is that conversations can take place, meaningful conversations can take place only with, with inside the limits of, of, of a group. Whereas actually, most of us have experienced through the course of our lives, almost anybody who has conversations have experience of talking across boundaries, not to necessarily tell them what they've got to do, but you work out shared, you, you kind of negotiate shared meanings and you ask them what it's like for over there and what it's like here. And you begin to kind of talk about it, experience, not because they're the same experience exactly on both sides, but because we can work out to, to share each other's meaning sufficiently to have a conversation. It's a bit like talking to somebody in a different language that you're not really, very, very good at. So conversations can actually reach more things than, than, than communities and groups can. In, in a, a sense. And I think when you talk about the difference between common sense and, and, and norms, or it's very often the norms are ones that we, refer, we have, have, a, have application or that we invoke in the course of a conversation. Yeah. But, and it's because we can actually reach beyond these boundaries that it doesn't, you know, we can set common sense aside temporarily and go with what we want to argue. Does that sort of. Yeah. Could I cite a top example? A multinational corporation owns newspapers and uh, men's web shops. Uh, it's in its interest to provoke uh, people to change their phones very rapidly in order to keep up with fashion. Mm -hmm. So it owns uh, papers like the Daily Mail and puts across the lie that uh, it's not. Your clothes are wearing out, you would buy a new suit at uh, an enormous price. It might force its employees to buy new suits at frequent intervals in order to keep up demand for mm -hmm. uh, its uh, clothing companies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, common sense dictates that, as we meet, I may be, it's a whole bunch of yeah. I be totally unacceptable in that society because A, I make my clothes, B, they were unconventional because they're not my support, they aren't, and C, these will last three score years and ten because it's reinforcing matches where it rubs on the fourth leg, mm -hmm. you see. Now, if I propose that women uh, harvest nettles, and turn them into metal fabric, and have parish clothing workshops with computer-aided design. Everybody measured up in every village or town, and then the computer uh, cuts the cloth, and therefore everybody has uh, clothes at cost price. Mm -hmm. uh, by tailoring the shops of unwanted, 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 unemployed people, that is, mentally handicapped people, people with Asperger's syndrome that like I have, crippled people, have the community workshops, uh, which are belong to the parish, uh, so that there's everywhere people bring their own clothes uh, within the parish. The talk tailoring, as I talk myself tailoring, this would collide head on with the multinational company yeah. forcing us to yeah. buy their brand suits. You see, yeah. the strict consequences of the parish clothing workshops. It promotes the general good. Mm -hmm. People are empowered when they master a skill like tailoring mm -hmm. or cookery or bricklaying, and yet our society becomes the precise opposite. Mm -hmm. It's the mass superfaction of the common people, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to have a, a movement that affirms the common dignity of every one of us by defying the multinationals. Well, taking over our lives. Yeah, yeah I mean, just, uh, I mean, I, I, I very much agree with what you, what you say, actually. Just in terms of the, the, the term common sense, this is just to, to, to agree with what you, you're saying. But that sense number one, um, you're talking about the common good that, uh, the, um, 18th century philosopher, uh, Francis Hutchison yeah. translates the term census communities from Latin yeah. into, into English to, in, in, as public sense. Yeah? yeah. 
Yeah. And then being an 18th century character, public has got a nice K at the end. You know, so yeah, public, yeah. public sense, yeah? But, but what he means by public sense with a sense of what is what is common, the yeah. common good, yeah. yeah, in essence. In fact, he's a man who, in a different bit of his philosophy, he, he I think I'm right in saying he is responsible for coining the, the, the phrase, the basic, the greatest good of the greatest number. Yes. Yeah. So that, and, and his, his notion of common sense was that it was as, as an a, awareness of, of the common concern, the overall concerns. Yeah. So, so yeah. And I also completely agree with what you say about, um, multinational, uh, instructions about, you know, you, unless you've bought a, a bit of clothing from, the shop that's not proper clothing, yeah? yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's the, it, it, the, unless you bought something, it's not real, yeah? yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, there's lots of, of common senses around, I mean, accepted senses that are directly to be challenged, yeah? Challenged. So, so that, so that's, it's not a, a common sense isn't just a matter of saying, oh yeah, it's whatever is obvious in a particular society, far from it. It's what can sustain, be sustained in a critical discussion of whatever is, is at, at issue. So, yeah, I mean, I agree, I agree with what, what you were saying. Richard, I was thinking that um, the, the common sense um, philosophy, um, its idea of there being interdisciplinary, yeah. um, is getting kind of eased out of our society. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about being talking about education. I mean, I was a young teacher. We used to teach in projects. So we would do a project about the Romans and we would look at the way of life, the numerical system, where they came from. So it encompassed all the different areas of the curriculum. We now have the national curriculum. We do so many hours of this mm. and then you do yeah. so many hours of that, mm. so many hours of the next thing. And it seems to me that we've got away from this idea that different disciplines are linked mm. and that everything is connected to everything else. And if you change mm. something over here, mm. like how old your clothes made in a factory in yeah. Korea or something, mm. that is going to change something else over there. Mm. And I also thought that if we're going to try and bring this back, which, you know, if I talk about this, it's not... Yeah, yeah, it's, we're, doing, we're doing it now already. We're set changing society. <laughs> yeah. And that it might lead to some kind of dialogue mm -hmm. situation where, I mean, this was very much sort of you talking to us and me mm. asking questions and, and everything, but... Um, you've heard me bang on about the dialogue idea yeah. before, and, and I just think the two things could be linked. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what's yeah, linked. yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yes. I, I think that a, a generalism without dialogue or without discussion or without conversation would be almost a contradiction yeah. in terms. I, I think um, it takes two. You know, Here's a kind of catchphrase for you. It takes at least two people to be critical. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Going on yeah. from that, um, with taking that point up, the value that any number of words, expressions, express, mm. um, they vary. Therefore, and perhaps we should be looking at um, which views have the most weight, because each individual view has its own weight. Uh, its own do, you mean view, do you mean views in common sense, or do, uh, and one and two, or do you mean in a general kind of way? Uh, from psychology, so common sense two, no, common sense one, oh, the, okay, the yeah. consensus. Mm. Consensus is driven mm. not by all voices, but mm. by few. Mm -hmm. such as the media owners, um, mm -hmm. the mainstream media politicians, mm -hmm. um, coming further down, if you're a teacher, mm -hmm. then perhaps your view may contain more weight than that of a labourer, depending on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
So we are making concrete by who we are So there is a, it's a there is a, an epistemological issue within um, consensus. Mm -hmm. That's also who we say to listen to. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether um, one way communications and networking will change that. I think that perhaps our technology has given our children the opportunity to distribute the weight of political and um, um, legal and corporate viewpoints. Yeah, <clears throat> I think one thing that that specialisms do very often is, is fix meanings and give only one particular meaning to, to, to like in like in particles physics for instance that word particle will have a point a very you know whereas most of us might have a particle in you know, there's a particle for instance you know, but but um which is a meti but, but, but yes but 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 you know but 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 it, it, one thing that that, that that specialism do is kind of narrow it the meaning down now Point about generalism, it, you, it isn't just a matter of, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, I mean, I'm going, yeah, it, it's not a matter of making the, the meaning blurry by going back and making it blurry, but it's a matter of being alive to the nuances and the resonances, the different resonances that people are using. When they're, when they're, and it's not that, I mean, people do keep track of that in conversation, don't they? But it's a, it can, I imagine from a teacher's point of view, it's quite scary. If you're teaching a, a specialism, you can say, right, children or boy, whatever, that, that's what, you know, write down this meaning so-and-so, and, so, and there, there we are. Whereas actually, if, 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 if someone can say at the end, oh, well, but, you know, by particle, I mean what you throw at kids in the playground. But, you know, if you make something, you know, then, it, then things just become a bit more open-ended and it's more predictable. You can't tell where a discussion is going to go and you've got to take chances in your in your communication. And I can imagine it's quite a... a, a Scary thing for a, for a teaching point. I know, well, I know it is from a, at the university level. It's going to be, you know, things that are tight and, and restricted or you can, well, you can just, you know, like, if you're, you know, that, that's a nice, neat thing to do. Yeah. That's the opposite of a, of a, um, of a generalist thing. I guess the difference between saying, um, you know, learn that mm. and then try and reproduce that. But I think that's a the, 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 yeah, I don't know, critical, the, the baccalaureate thing, I mean, it, no, I don't want to get involved in that actually, because I, I don't really know enough about it, but there is a danger, isn't there, of making, of, of thinking of generalism in terms of a, a, a smattering of all the specialisms, <laughs> whereas, whereas the kind of general education <clears throat> that George Davy and others talk about is more a, a, a kind of general education that focuses on um, on first principles. And uh, so, why, and why do you define a particle in this way? You know, what's the, you know, and, and can should we agree with, on, <clears throat> on on that on that definition? You know, it, it goes into fundamentals in a way that, that a, smatter, a smattering of, of specialisms that doesn't really, 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 really do. Um, another thought, but I've forgotten what it was. I will not interrupt him, but when people are able to think <coughs> randomly, we did bonus books on the subject, mm -hmm. uh, it called Wings Mount uh, Convulsive Exponential uh, Reconnection of the Brain Cells. Mm -hmm. When I taught myself German at school by 16, this initiated the primary driving force of my life because I was able to think in German. A BK has seen in heaven. Uh, now, uh, this 
connectedness. Alan Turing, the <coughs> computer, had a much more connected brain than nearly everybody else. Uh, and knew it. Uh, we were a tragic man who committed suicide, but he knew why he was different to the common run of people. And so it problems that if children are taught, well, by my own rights, by my fictional philosopher's ways, to connect right here on our boots, mathematics, history, and geology, uh, why Edinburgh, where it is, and had there been a different course of the glaciers, there might have been a city called Wallace, where I'd still it to be, and why Walters were the first to find the Daniel Wright's world, you see what I mean? Mm. Alternative worlds where Edinburgh did not, not exist, but the said capital was called Wallaceborough, I think it was the right, right good name for that, uh, where Stirling ought to be. Uh, now, it's simply, well, Alan Wright's view was counting sea anemones and rock pools, that is, uh, marine biology, statistics, and uh, all uh, meteorology amongst us when we survey of the fictional nature reserve called the Great Pool, or Large Rock Pool. Uh, so, this ability to link together any number of disparate concepts to form synthesis. Uh, my father hammered me for mentioning a uh, connection between Roman roads and toads in Shropshire. <laughs> a toadway under a Roman roadway, former Roman road. Uh, he slammed me for this logical connection between Roman roads and toads. Yes. But th if we could do that all the time, we can expand our mental capacity and solve the problem in all sorts of ways by making. Yeah. Uh, Buttons from bits of card number plates yeah, yeah, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Building a house from scarlet card number plates. Yeah. Drop and sink. Have a greenhouse from card number plates. Yeah. You see? Yeah, uh, I, I, that's I, I the sort of challenge when the auction rise to. It's an interesting challenge. It gets into another area altogether, and I know that you've got the question. I haven't forgotten. But there was just, just, but the, the, it's funny how, funny how quite often the sort of connections that you're talking about, like Roman roads and toads. For instance, can seem comic. The normal, a, a, a frequent response to them is to laugh. Yeah, and, and I mean, and if you stay on the track, but not necessarily the Roman road, but the conversational track. <laughs> yeah, then, then 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 there's no no no. It's, it's all very solemn. Yeah, but if you start making connection with other things, yeah. they become comic. It's like a surreal painting. You know, two things are completely different put together. And there's and now I'm not against humour in saying that. On the opposite, and the quite the opposite. I mean I think that actually being more humorous in our conversation would be a very good thing to do. But Turing built that machine which is now a museum piece, it was the most top secret thing in Britain and he built it at Bensley Park because he had his capacity to mm -hmm. ah bits of a Bristol boat flight the yes. first aeroplane yeah. with an airport radar yeah. uh, that ever existed the most top secret plane in the sky. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could see it in the dark, you yeah. see. Yeah. And other things he built on junk heaps. So yeah. He built that machine yeah. and because he had his natural capacity mm -hmm. Now, uh, modern railways have fooled me and provide pictures of my modern train and anything that weird thing. And if we could teach it at every school, then we, our kids would be polymaths. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a question, so, Susan. What? Sorry, you can say something. Yeah, I think there's a question. I was just going uh, to have a look around the room. Ah. And seeing what other questions there were. Oh, sorry, I just, sorry, you're right. <laughs> I've, I've got a mouthful of. <laughs> Pardon me, sorry. Then you kind of came up to the front of the room. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so we were talking about a singular common sense. Mm. And I was just wondering about the notion of pluralizing it so it becomes common senses. And I was thinking about that in relation to your discussion of crossing boundaries. So there may be different common senses. And then the question is, well, what are the skills that you need in order to understand? Well, what, what, what is it? What's, it, what's your, what, sorry, what's your unit? What, a common sense? What, 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 what's it? What, well, are you, you were talking about this sort of this negotiated consensus building, which happens, uh, building which happens uh, in context, that would signify yeah. that, that negotiated sense building is happening yeah. in different places. Yeah. And I was just thinking about that in relation to census commons number two, mm. which is about the way we perceive the world. Yes. So there's, uh, there's 
a very well-known instance in, in Africa where there are people who actually see the world mm -hmm. colour in a very different way. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the skills that you need in order to actually understand that somebody else is coming yeah. at this from a different notion of common yeah. sense? Yeah, can we talk yeah. about common yeah. sense? There's also, yes, I mean, I think we've got to be honest, yes, you can, I mean, you must, I mean, for instance, I think we might make out here, I don't really know about what the experimental psychology said, but I think mostly people assume that sight is our primary sense and other things are sort of brought in, whereas actually if, you, if, if we were organised differently and, and smell was our primary Sense our kind of overall kind of feeling of the world would be much more modulated and more sense of in and out depth and then more I, I don't quite know what more flowy it would be a different kind of world altogether. But now the, the common senses in the, the plural and my question about the, the, the what unit you're, you're thinking of is in my notion of a, a common. Sorry, I can draw a diagram. Um, I mean, if you've got a whole batch of people here, so yeah, you, you could say, well, they've got a common sense, and then what other people, but in fact, the way I think of it is, is, is that there's always this question of, of, of background. Yeah, so there's these people who are in the room with the walls around here, and then it, 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 and it sort of shades over to a, a really almost an infinitely wide sort of penumbra, yeah? So, so that when someone applies a common sense perspective or to a topic, so whether you're discussing economics or theology, whatever it might be, um, but then what the common sense person does to bring their common sense perspective in is to focus on questions of background, yeah? not just the people in this room, but people have, have uh, conversations that might have, might that we might have, not just the one that we're having. At the moment. So there really isn't a kind of, I mean, there are, I said yes because there are different common sense, different ways of which it common sense, but they're not really discrete, we thought of as discrete common senses. They sort of, to apply a common sense um, perspective is, to, is, is already to reach beyond the notion of units yeah, of common sense. I think that's the way I was. I'm not saying that that's that one has to be doing that. Universals here. Are we talking about a universal? Well, I don't, I don't really. No, because if you have a universal, that's just like a very, very big version of, of that. <laughs> I mean, I, I would want to know what lies outside the universal. <laughs> you see what, what I mean? Which, which, which indicates a skill, you need a skill in order to be able, in order skill. To, be able to move beyond yes. that boundary and yes. realize that there is a boundary. Yeah. And that you're, in one, and you need to move beyond in order to see that there's another. Yeah, yeah, well, that, 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 um, yeah, terminology from the philosopher Kant, yeah, he had two kinds of judgment. There's determinate judgment and reflective judgment, yeah, of what Pascal calls the judgment, for instance, yeah. Now, um, but that, uh, but determinate judgment is judgment of particulars that fall underneath some known universal, so think of it like. Uh, we fall underneath the, the, the universe, and we know that this is a chair or something like that. That is, 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 is a chair. A determinate judgment or judgment is a judgment where we don't know in advance what the universe is. Yeah, we are sort of in exercising, making the judgment. We're saying, oh, it's it's a bit, it's it's a. Tollball, isn't it? Or something like that. You know, we're, kind of, we're kind of inventing at the same time as we're, we're judging. And I, I think that the judgments of common sense are more like the, the, the reflective judgments, yeah? Or choose one than they are the determinant judgments. Yeah. But, but that's just my kind of, I mean, that, whereas some bits of what I said are kind of down the line history of ideas. I could think that's, I, it wasn't me who said that, somebody else said it. That's, that's me. So if I'm talking nonsense, it's me who's talking nonsense. <laughs> so I wonder, um, you know, I mean, this is a very, very broad subject, of course. Um, and I'm looking at the, the world, which to me at the moment seems to be going so off 
the rails in the sphere of madness, um, particularly driven by the economic pattern at the moment. And I wonder how many philosophers have actually stated it in quite clear terms how mad and far away our current income, our relationship with the natural world, mm -hmm. the, the world of economics. Which to me isn't a science, it's just a media of thing which we have just become so uh, conditioned to accept and believe. And yet, from a, a rational point of view, it just seems to be the same. Um, and I mean, I'm just looking around the room and, and seeing this, for instance, people have got pens in their hands. And for a long while, I thought, surely we could invent a pen where a refill, you just put a new refill in, yeah, in yeah. the body of the pen, as opposed to fling the whole thing in the bin every time, yeah. over and over again. Because over the course of our lifetime, we're getting through hundreds of these. And it's insane, it's total madness. The great example for me that drives me insane is mobile phone charges. You know, there are hundreds of mobile phone charges. They all do exactly the same thing. It could be engineered to have common sense so that they all power at the same rating, all the mobile phones on the planet. But there just seems to be, we're, we're so different from this. And in terms of like specializing and having a general perspective, it's that when you challenge the specialists, the so-called experts, the foundation to their psychology mm -hmm. is pulled away from them. And their response to that is confrontational, yeah. rather than being open-minded, and thinking about uh, in a more holistic perspective mm -hmm. and looking into the future of what we will pass on to future generations, if that is going to be the case. Um, when we challenge the experts, mm -hmm. they get very insecure. Mm -hmm. There's, there seems to be so much obfuscation mm -hmm. in the world of specialization. Mm -hmm. It's become so complex, it, it goes beyond human skill. Mm -hmm. You have to literally dedicate your entire life to become a specialist. Mm -hmm. And in that, it becomes intimidating, it becomes overwhelming, and to me, that is one of the reasons why we're struggling to actually challenge this. Because if you if you want to take on the business of law, you have to give up your whole life to study, to get confidence, to take it on, or design the future, or whatever else. Um, and one point I'd like, I'd like to put to you. Um, thinking from uh, the, the rational perspective of conflict, um, a friend Sheila and I have been brought together through the peace movement. And I, uh, in the 1990s, I had the fortune or misfortune of traveling across Bosnia to start the aftermath of the war there. And coming out of that experience and having other experiences acting upon me, I came to a position, a personal position of rational pacifism. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about that and the more I've looked at the world around me, that to me seems to be such a default common sense mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. If people have enough opportunity to sit and rationally ponder mm -hmm. this, I mean, in the mad rat race that we live in, we have so little time and space within our lives mm -hmm. to actually sit there and rationally mm -hmm. grapple with this. This issue, uh, this very, very significant issue, because we end up squandering so much of our potential in conflict and in war and violence as well. And so I wonder what, how you feel, because so often you hear people say, oh, but I'm a pacifist. And that to me is such a common line, and yet to me, in my personal experience, it, it seems that it becomes a default position. Rational pacifism, when you put common sense, into that thought. So what's your, sorry, could you, do, yeah, sure, I mean, I, mean, I go along with a lot of things that you say, but what, what question, what, what question are you asking me? Well, how do you feel about the, the notion, the concept of rational pacifism? Mm. Do you see that as a default position that connects with the notion of common sense? Yeah, I, I have been, I, I, I charge them differently because the, 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 the history of the people who've been involved in common sense philosophy have been but far from all that have been passive. I mean, there's a, a, a like Scottish Enlightenment figures are, are remarkably politically conservative and probably patriotic and goodness knows, knows what. There's, um, so there's an, 
I suppose I, about the, as far as the history of ideas is concerned, what I have to say honestly is that the notion of common sense philosophy has got all sorts of different twists and turns and different. I mean, the, the, the idea is, goes back can be found in in in, in, in Aristotle, but Aristotle um, endorsed slavery, <laughs> for instance. Yeah. So so that it would be I would be completely misleading you to say that there was a kind of one to one. There's one social outlook or political outlook or whatever that corresponds to the notion of common sense. It just, it's historically, that has not been, been the, 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 the case. Um, as to myself, uh, what would I want to say here? Uh, there can be situations where trying to have a commonsensical conversation with somebody else can be self-defeating, yeah? I mean, and, and, and where defending oneself against someone else seems to me to be a defensible point. I'm not saying that much has to be killed, but, but nonetheless, that, that a defense, that, that, that kind of thinking strategically and <coughs> tactically about the situation is difficult to imagine that more altogether. That is just not the case at all. That said, as a goal or um, a, a first a prima facie principle that one can apply to start with, can one operate yeah, on a basis of a commonsensical mind, meaning conversation, yeah, to see if that's possible is a very good way forward to try out and see where one can get yeah, by doing that. In other words, I'm, I'm like many, many people, I would consider myself to be a pacifist, but not a kind of um, in principle pacifist, not, a, not, not necessarily pacifist. I can concede that there could be situations where that wouldn't, where a pacifist set of principles wouldn't easily be applicable. Yeah. So a, a muddy kind of kind of response. I don't know if that that's, that's me trying to be honest about it. If you see what I mean. But that's thinking. Um, that's my. Uh, I'm not talking about myself as a philosopher or a political theorist or anything like that. Uh, I'm just thinking about myself in terms of my own attitudes. Yeah, as they the, the, the consulting my intuitions, what I feel about things more than what I know about things. Well, what about natural law? Uh, thinking about common sense and its relationship to what we might understand as a What about natural law? Well, I suppose the idea of, of doing no harm, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the going beyond this mm -hmm. current paradigm of what we understand as law, mm -hmm. uh, the force of law, something to mm -hmm. force, rather than just a sense of mm -hmm. common morality. I, 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 don't, I don't believe in natural law at all. <laughs> well, no, the, 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 the modern natural law tradition starts off, for instance, with Grotius in the early 17th century. And Grotius believes, as a print question, natural law, that a war fought in defense of free trade was justifiable. So natural law could be, can, I mean, the number of things that have been considered to be natural law are huge. And an awful lot of, and some of them have been really unpleasant things. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't agree with Grotius on and saying that kind of a war like that is defensible. But he certainly thought of one. He very close came, to, he came very close to saying that that actually an act of piracy is is, is defensible. He, 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 not a nice guy. The man is old school in the time of the law. I think we, we, we try to sanitize it now, or, or we try to, it's much more organized now, it's much um, more widespread, but hasn't managed to develop its market, it's become more I missed the beginning of what you were saying. Could you, that's been resolved through, yeah. through violence. Yeah. It's right, it's in a way. Yeah. Animals and humans are not good. Yeah. Does that lend itself to a patriarchal uh, society? I don't know if there's evidence of that in matriarchal society. There's very few examples of matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Sorry, Jim. Education as opposed to using common sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly recall uh, when I was a teacher, I wanted to buy would my child be more involved in education. I wanted to use his common sense. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, there was, there was a kind of that thing about we value it, but we don't necessarily value it mm -hmm. um, as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of all, say, more formal education. And then the other thought, and I think it's, a, it's not historical, but I think it's a very current dilemma the number of young people who have experience within the current education system, the specialisms and the constant, um, you know, working away from general mm -hmm. principles. At the same time, the minute they start to look for work, for careers, what's demanded of them is that they think outside the box, that they have transferable skills, they have generic skills, generic ways of thinking. It's almost as if, you know, what is being asked of them is the opposite to what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. um, so, so an educated, formal education system then has taken them away from directions of thinking. Suddenly, they're being asked to represent those things, to have a versatility that the second yeah. marginal generation never was asked for. So that's one of the current. Um, Do you want to leave that the top? Do you want to leave that? No, 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 I, 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 not, not a long answer. I, 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 I mean, I agree with lots of what, with much of what you, what you say. I mean, I, I think the, the, for me, for my understanding of common sense, the common sense tradition, it's very close to a discussion. I mean, what leads, common sense leads on rather rapidly to a, a, a conversation about fundamental principles about whatever it is that's being under that's under discussion. And that thread threatens to undermine or, or to put in question two rather opposite, two different things. One is kind of everyday assumptions. Well I mean just know that that's the case. That's you know that's sort of whatever whatever the you know um pop music is good and that's that. You know, is, you know, that's a, sort of, sort of thing. So questions that kind of stuff. But it also questions it, it puts into put a question mark against specialisms, yeah, of various kinds too. Because specialisms can many can be incredibly pompous and kind of you say tight ass you know, they're kind of sort of oh but, but we all know what a particle is. A particle means such and such. Stuff. If you if someone says that a particle is like sweet they're just ignorant louts, you know. So, you know, so, and, and common sense person say, well, no, why, you know, why, why should a particle be defined in this way, not, not that, you know. So, so, is it kind of on one hand or the other hand? Yeah, yeah. sorry, that's it. Yeah. Well, no, I, 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 you, you have a good question? Well, no, it's I think I'll link to you from experiencing common sense. It's sense to people. Education doesn't prepare them necessarily to require and you know, go to other people. And I was thinking reflexively about the experience of the 
collective experience of practice is getting here. You know, and, and at a different time, different points in the conversation, for those who came in later than the beginning of the formal talk by yourself, mm -hmm. they people reference the, the orange march, and there's another march as well. It's a, you know, drop the bar. And so it's how you know, getting here and that being the, the, the gateway to this environment. Common sense mm -hmm. is a reference to something. And um, here you've got the, the whiteboard. On one side of the place, there's permanent mm -hmm. ink, so you can't take the five cents at all. And on this side, you've got something which can be rubbed off, which has two, two legs to start with. Yeah, it's really quite that, that was on the ready when you came into the room. Does that people? Yeah. Yes. Right? Well, okay, so these are normal things that are permanently on this floor. <laughs> there's, a there's a previous conversation. So here, what we share is something which is, you know, whatever has been for each other. And I was just wondering about the experience of common sense, mm -hmm. whether Having a conversation about common sense in the way we've had it, coming as an antidote, going to where we're going to go, mm -hmm. in a place where we reference text and the media and things like that, it's part of it. You know, does, it does it vitalize the sense of common sense for anybody else? It does to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this trip fits an anxious to stay in this thing. Um, I think it fits in with that. What I would like to stress, because of personal experiences, there are different, there were lots of teachers of ours, that's for sure. There are lots of different ways of learning. Mm. Uh, what, uh, I, where I see the Southern, I both are dyslexic, but uh, we're really bad fellows and uh, struggling and um, had the hard times and all of that. But when when we got to the stage where we were asked to do something totally different, that that uh, we excelled at something. Mm. So the difference mm. between the two things to illustrate um, uh, uh, technical things, mm. uh, you know, think parts that go yeah. together and work and yeah. making yeah. a set designing. And yeah. developing yeah. things that that uh, were applied. Uh, we when uh, we got to the stage that we were using the skills, a lot of them we taught ourselves mm -hmm. because we found an area yeah. that could work for yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, then. We, we suddenly forged ahead mm. at that stage mm. because we were good at technical stuff, mm. real things, putting things together mm -hmm. and knowing why one thing would work better than another. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's uh, but just, just that, really, if you have the kind of brain that does that. Mm -hmm. So we both have a rough time at school yeah, yeah. to do with our spelling yeah. and all that side of learning, mm -hmm. slow readers and things. But when we were asked to take on technical jobs, mm -hmm. myself in the Navy, that we, we excelled at that. We were, we ahead of the others. We were working and obviously it was a, just a different way of solving problems and seeing things. Problem and mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really quite extreme. We were very poor mm -hmm. at our spelling and such like. And we were very good at the technical side of things. Yeah. 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 So, 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 round off, we're talking about, we're talking about metaphors. Well, let me give you a metaphor. Again, very. Bolish. Common sense is a good at all the stuff. 
with the screen. Yeah. <laughs> and that means that we are very we're looking at what the, 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 the specialism of rights is a form of fundamental principles of specialism. Well, that's it. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it's, it's been a, a for, for me, wonderful, wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I, uh, I, I hope to learn common sense by negotiating and learning what everybody has to share. Uh, anybody can do it soft. If you want to share, please do. Um, this is one small one. And uh, uh, yeah, have a, a lovely afternoon. And special thanks to Jenny for, for helping yeah. great people out. And uh, extra special thanks to Susan for, for bringing together all, all the foods and helping out. And, uh, cheers. Right. If you're around tomorrow, uh, there is another talk. Shane Hart's going to be talking about his uh, cultural experience in Nepal. He lived a year in Nepal, and that's over at Meadows Bar, the Clue Street. Uh, it's between 3 and 5 p.m. And on the 4th, there is a talk, uh, Mike McKenzie is talking about the incredible shrinking brain. And this will be followed by a pop quiz run by Health in Mind. They're trying to raise funds, but they did a wonderful project. But so 7 to 9 is a talk and a, a social followed by a pop quiz. Uh, have a great weekend. Yes. Right, thank you. Uh, and those viewers are the ones that are here. The ones you've given to me are here. Uh, uh, yeah, because I've got. Uh, that's, that's what you gave me. Uh, 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 uh,